Welcome to Film Review Part 2. I'm Justin Rempel. Uh, in this presentation, we are going to be really focusing in on the art of cinematography, which is the camera equipment and techniques used to create a story in film. This is one of the most um, important aspects of filmmaking, which is why we're spending a, a whole presentation talking about it. Uh, it's also one of the most unique. The thing that makes a movie different than other art forms is the fact that you are using cameras to capture and tell your story. So let's take a deeper look. <clears throat> Remember, this series is for the purpose of writing good film reviews. If we want to write good film reviews, we need to understand how movies are made uh, the different uh, techniques and equipment and people that go into creating this artistic product at the end. Uh, it's a lot. It's a lot of different moving parts. And so it's important to break it down and understand it piece by piece. Let's go over the, uh, the basic structure of a film review. Um, what is a film review? This is a written piece and it's responding to a movie. It's saying what the movie is about um, and what you think. The way to begin a film review is to give the basic information, the name of the film, the year it was released, and what genre it is. Uh, action, comedy, horror, western, sci-fi, that kind of thing. And then you're going to launch into these three parts, and I remember these three parts with the acronym SAP, S-A-P. Uh, the first part, the letter S, stands for summary. The first thing to do in your film review is to give a brief overview of the story's main plot points. What are the basic things that happen in the story? The second part, the letter A, stands for analysis, which is where you break down the film's strengths and weaknesses. And here's where it's really good to understand how a movie is made so you can properly critique what it's doing well and what it's not. The third part, the letter uh, P, stands for personal response. Personal response. Uh, your personal thoughts, feelings, and recommendations. Um, so this is the part where you say what you think. Um, and again, it's helpful to know how the movie is made so you can form an educated and informed opinion. For more on how to approach structuring these three components, see my presentation on book reviews. This presentation is really focusing on the artistic components of film that reviewers should evaluate in their analysis and response. Um, and throughout this presentation, we're going to look for the little green box. It's going to give us tips on how to write good film reviews. Uh, and here's the first one. When you're writing your film review, you need to um, act as if the people reading your review have never seen the movie before. So everything needs to be explained. Don't assume anything. Uh, don't leave out important plot points. Don't include inside jokes without explaining them. Uh, state everything as if the person has not seen it before. All right, let's get started with our discussion on cinematography. Uh, cinematography is the process of capturing footage on camera. Okay, so this is the stuff that makes movies different than other art forms, is that we're working with pieces of technology we call cameras, uh, and we're using those cameras in particular ways to uh, tell a story. Cinematographers are the people involved in movie making that make artistic decisions about how to capture the movie on camera. And they consider many different aspects to create different artistic effects based on the story that they're trying to tell. A camera operator is a person who's responsible for working with the camera equipment. Uh, some important terms about um, using cameras, working with cameras. A shot is what we call the continuous camera footage from one camera in between takes. Takes are different attempts or tries at uh, capturing a scene. Uh, they're also called cuts, which is when the, um, the camera rolling stops. So a camera shot is the time from when the camera starts rolling. We call that point action. We say action, the camera starts rolling, to when it stops, and when, that's when we say cut. Uh, to mean that the shot is going to stop. We call this action of filming with a camera shooting. Um, we shoot things with a camera uh, to capture camera footage. 
Um, a special kind of shot is a oneer. Uh, a oneer is a long, continuous single shot without any cuts at all. So sometimes you get these really long shots in uh, in movies. Um, sometimes you even get entire films that are oneers. They're called one-shot films, also single take films, continuous shot feature film. The whole movie, the whole feature length film is shot in a single take. Uh, so some really good examples of this are uh, um, a movie adaptation of Macbeth, like the Shakespeare play, uh, came out in 1982. It was produced in Hungary and it was done as a one a one-shot film, the whole thing, one take. Very difficult to coordinate and, and do properly. Russian Ark is a film that came out in 2002, uh, made in Germany and Russia. Uh, it's a very long film and all done in one continuous take. And one that I've seen and I greatly enjoy is the German film Victoria, which came out in 2015. And it's about a young woman who gets caught up in some criminal activity. Uh, and it's basically one wild, unpredictable night in her life. And so when the film starts, um, it is pitch black, we're, we're in the early hours of the morning, and by the time the film ends, the sun is coming up, and it's all done in one take. Very impressive. Uh, some films are made to look like they are shot in one take. They're kind of pretend oneers, and the cuts are hidden. You can hide the cuts in a couple ways. You can hide it as the camera moves behind uh, sets or props. Uh, you can hide it uh, with a really fast whip pan or a really blurry shot. Um, and with computer editing technology, you can hide your cuts better than ever. Um, one of the best examples of this is the film Rope, done in 1948 by Alfred Hitchcock. Uh, this is probably the really first iconic example of someone attempting a one -er or a film that at least looks like it. Uh, some more recent examples are the film Birdman in 2014. Um, and the World War One film 1917, which just came out a few years ago in 2019. Uh, so the basic thing you want to think about when you're writing your film review, I'm looking at the little green box now, is um, this is a lot like poetry. Uh, we have a whole bunch of different techniques that we can use, and we need to use them with purpose. So when you're writing about the camera techniques that are used, think about not just what technique is being used, um, think about why it might be used. Why did the cinematographers or why did the director choose to shoot things that way? What effect does it have? What does it uh, create for you? Uh, is that a good effect? Does it work for you? Is it a bad effect? Does it not work for you? Do you understand what they were trying to do, but you don't really like it? These are the things to think about when you're analyzing and critiquing the cinematography. Equipment. Uh, cinematographers choose to work with different kinds of equipment, different types of cameras, different types of lenses, and the things that you're working with create different effects. They produce different results. Uh, there's lots of different types of specialty cameras, um, and 3D technology has existed for a long time, but only quite recently has it become mainstream. Uh, the first Avatar film by James Cameron was the first big blockbuster that launched 3D um, cinematography into mainstream theatrical releases. And uh, there have been many 3D films since. So you need special cameras to shoot in 3D. They create a perception of 3D. It's, it's kind of an optical illusion, uh, which means they're adding on a third dimension. So normally you have uh, height and width when you're shooting, right? You're, you're creating pictures which are two dimensional width and they have height. 3D cameras create an illusion of depth as well. And the way they do this, there's a couple different ways. Some cameras use multiple lenses. They use two or more lenses simultaneously to record multiple points of view. And then they blend those into one image that looks like it has depth when viewed with the proper 3D glasses. Uh, others use a single lens that shifts position uh, to capture an image that looks like it's 3D. Again, you have to view it through special glasses, you need uh, special projectors to display it, and you need special cameras to capture it. Some cameras can shoot underwater. Um, you need waterproof cameras to do that. 
And some cameras can capture images in a full circle, 360 degrees, um, kind of like a panoramic view. So there's all kinds of different specialty cameras that filmmakers might consider using. They also use uh, different types of lenses, and there's many, many of these. We could get much more technical, um, but a lens is uh, just a piece of glass in a camera that captures and focuses light. It's named after the, the part of your eye that does the same thing. Um, and there are many different types of lenses for cameras. A prime lens is just a basic fixed lens. It doesn't move, it doesn't do a whole lot. It just captures images. Uh, a zoom lens is a lens that has a capability of zooming in or out, right? Making objects appear closer, larger, farther away, smaller. Um, not all lenses can do that. You need special kinds of lenses. Um, a wide angle lens can capture a wider picture uh, than a, a normal lens. So if you want to shoot something in uh, a, a more widescreen shot or the, the whole film in a more widescreen format. And a fisheye lens is um, uh, capturing a super wide field and it's so wide it kind of bows out at the edges. Uh, it kind of looks like a bubble. Everything bends uh, towards the edges and uh, usually it's it's portrayed in kind of a circular fashion. So think about when you're writing your review how these different pieces of equipment uh, used to create the film impacts the final artistic result. Let's talk frame rate and resolution. So we need to think about what movies actually are for this. Movies are made up of photographs or still images uh, called frames, right? It's not actually a picture that's moving. It's a whole bunch of still pictures that are shown together very, very quickly to create the illusion of movement. Uh, each still is called a frame, and each frame is made up of dots called pixels. Uh, resolution refers to the quality and clarity of an image. It is measured by the number of pixels or dots uh, that make up each frame. The more pixels you have in your picture, the higher the resolution. So the more dots, uh, the more precise the picture is, the more clarity you have, the more detail you can show, that's higher resolution. So uh, if you're hearing something like 4K, which is um, quite excellent resolution, that's referring to uh, 4,000 pixels in each frame very good resolution. I think you can even get higher resolutions now on, on home TVs like 5K and stuff. It's it's getting crazy, this world we live in. Um, frame rate. By showing multiple frames per second, movies create the illusion of movement, right? It's a whole bunch of stills shown very quickly in rapid succession. So this is why they're called motion pictures. Um, movies short for movements, right? The average frame rate for a film is 24 frames per second or FPS is the abbreviation. So that means every single second that you're watching, you're actually seeing 24 pictures shown really, really quickly. Um, and that is faster than our eyes can actually detect or pick up on. We cannot tell that there are a bunch of still images. There's too many of them packed into too short a time. So 24 frames per second looks to us like pretty natural movement. Um, if you want to, you can mess around with that standard frames per second rate you can drop it lower. Um, it's not very common. Uh, lower frame rates look choppy. Um, you usually don't want to do this, but one kind of exception is the animated Spider-Verse movies, which are coming out now, um, because animated movies use the same technique, a bunch of uh, frames per second. They drop the frame rate and make the motions look choppy, and it sort of starts to mimic comic book panels. A little bit. So they are going for a very particular effect there. Uh, typically movies are interested in upping the frame rate for higher frame rates uh, because higher frame rates look really smooth and clear. High frame rate cameras uh, shoot at higher rates and the kind of the standard HFR camera will shoot at double the standard speed, 48 frames per second. Um, video games have very high frame rates typically. They they go in 30 to 60 frames per second, but 60 is, is pretty standard. Uh, so that's even more. Um, some TVs can display up to 120 frames per second. Um, and super slow motion cameras, 
such as used by the slow-mo guys on YouTube, can shoot millions of frames per second. And uh, slow motion cameras need to shoot uh, in many, many frames per second to slow things down and really capture um, action that's happening very, very quickly in a small amount of time. Aspect ratio. Aspect ratio refers to an image's dimensions, uh, the width and the height of the screen as they relate to each other. Uh, the first number in the ratio is the width, the second number is the height. So what does this mean? Well, it helps if you know ratios from math, but let's look at an example. 1.85 to 1 is the first ratio we're going to talk about, and that's today's standard widescreen format uh, for movie theaters and, and um, movies that you're watching at home. That means that the screen, the actual picture that you're seeing, is 1.85 times as wide as it is tall. So it's a, almost twice as wide as it is tall. That rectangle, those are the dimensions or the proportions of uh, an average widescreen format film. Um, you can get wider than that. You can get widescreen movies. Uh, 2.39 to 1 is anamorphic widescreen, and that's the widest aspect ratio in modern cinema. So if you go to the theaters and you watch a, a film in widescreen, it's probably in this ratio, um, over twice as wide as it is tall. 16 to 9 is the standard aspect ratio for today's computer monitors and HD or high definition television sets. There are other aspect ratios that you can use though. There are many aspect ratios that are no longer commonly used, but they used to be used. So directors might decide to use them to try to recapture the feel of older cinema. So if you're watching a, a film and it looks like it's old, it might be the actual dimensions of the picture um, that make you feel that way. Some really old formats include 2.59 to 1 uh, to 2.69 to 1, which is called Cinerama. That's a super widescreen format that was created in the 1950s. It required uh, three 35 millimeter cameras to shoot. And when I say 35 millimeter, I'm referring to a measurement that's the width of the actual film that they were shooting with, right? Uh, because they use physical film to capture things uh, rather than the digital cameras that they work with today. Uh, 2.35 to 1 to 2.66 to 1. You can tell these are huge ratios. Uh, the, the width is well over two times as wide as it is tall. So very long, narrow um, width on these screens. That ratio is called Cinemascope, a super widescreen format developed by 20th Century Fox in 1953, kind of in response to Cinerama. These studios are in competition. Fox comes up with Cinemascope, and it's uh, superior to Cinerama because it only requires one 35 millimeter camera to capture. 2.76 to 1 is a huge, huge ratio, a very super widescreen format. And uh, that was created, used by shooting in 70 millimeter film. And um, some modern directors like Christopher Nolan and Quentin Tarantino, who are big film history buffs, uh, like to shoot in this epic super widescreen format uh, because it's also very cool and retro. Uh, and four to three is a very old, nearly square format. Uh, it's quite boxy, so you'll really notice if you're watching a film in this. I just watched a film um, called The Whale, uh, featuring, was directed by Darren Aronofsky and starring Brendan Fraser. And the reason Darren Aronofsky um, shot in this format is because he felt like the square format made his lead look bigger. And the, the lead is supposed to be a massive, uh, obese character. Uh, that's a big part of the storyline. So he wanted uh, Brendan Fraser to actually take up more of the screen. So how does this affect your viewing experience? Well, sometimes uh, you get these black bars, kind of like we have on this screen right now at the top and bottom. You might notice these sometimes, horizontal black bars at the top and bottom of your screen when you're viewing. Uh, that's called letter boxing, okay? Um, sometimes it goes the other way, not as commonly, but you might notice vertical black bars on the left and right of your screen. That's called pillar boxing because um, they're like pillars on the sides of your screen. 
So why do you see that sometimes? These are attempts to preserve the original aspect ratio in the transition from theater screen to home screen. Um, so they want you to have the same viewing experience um, and for the screen to be the same dimensions, they don't want to cut anything off. Uh, but in order to do that, they need to uh, kind of fill the screen on the sides a little bit to make it fit your home screen. Let's talk camera movement. Uh, there are all sorts of different ways that cinematographers can move their camera uh, to capture a story, right? Sometimes you just have a stationary camera that's just sitting there filming things, but often the camera <clears throat> is actually moving and that instantly um, creates different effects and makes for more interesting shots. A pan is what we call a basic side to side or horizontal movement. So anytime the camera view is just sliding left to right or right to left, uh, that's a pan. Uh, a whip pan is a term for a really rapid pan when the camera really whips from side to side and creates a blurring, dizzying effect. Okay, always think about the effect it creates, how it makes you feel. Is it effective in telling the story? Uh, a pedestal or a boom up or down is the exact opposite where it's an up and down vertical movement, raising and lowering, the camera's sliding up or it's sliding down, okay? Um, and a tilt is very similar. It's an up and down vertical movement, but it's swiveling on an axis, kind of like a head nodding. So the camera is just tilting up to look up or tilting down, okay? So these are, anytime you see the shot moving in these ways, left to right, it's a pan, up and down pedestal, or tilting up and down is called a tilt. Uh, a zoom isn't the camera actually moving, it, it's not it's the camera appearing as if it's moving. The zoom just means you're adjusting the lens. Again, you need a, a zoom lens to make this work. You're adjusting the lens to make images appear closer and larger by zooming in, getting really, really close, uh, or farther, smaller, zooming out, right? So it's an effective way of creating movement uh, without actually moving the camera, just adjusting the lens. A tracking shot, is a shot that follows its subject around. So you pick, say, your main character and they're walking through the streets and the camera just uh, follows them around. That's a tracking shot. Transportation, so this is moving the camera around with equipment. Uh, stationary cameras just sit in one place. Um, often they're just sitting on stands like tripods uh, or they're held by people. You can get handheld cameras, you can get shoulder cams that sit on the camera operator's shoulder. Um, and sometimes when you start moving the camera, uh, the person just starts walking around. So you have a shoulder cam or a handheld and the camera operator just walks around where they need to go. Uh, but you can use a variety of pieces of equipment for moving cameras around and that's desirable because you often get a little bit more smoothness in the camera movement. Uh, so for example, you can use dollies, which are just tracks, kind of like train tracks, and you set the camera up on wheels that fit into those tracks and you run it along the tracks. That's, uh, that's a dolly. You can use cranes um, to pick up and, and move and swivel with cameras that get some nice overhead shots or high angle shots. Um, helicopters <coughs> are quite, uh, or were quite commonly used now more and more we're seeing drone shots, right? Because drones um, are getting better and better. We can fly high quality cameras around with drones and get all kinds of <clears throat> excellent movements uh, from a variety of angles in the air. A key grip is the person responsible for positioning camera equipment. Very important role in, in the filmmaking process. And their assistant is called a best boy or the best boy grip, um, who's helping them to set up the camera equipment properly. Usually with camera movements, you want stabilizing equipment. You want to make the shot look smooth. You don't want people to notice the movement with any jarring. Uh, sometimes though, that's thrown out the window. Stabilization is disregarded and the camera is allowed to shake. This is called shaky cam. Uh, it can create all sorts of different effects, unsettledness, uh, busyness, uh, panic, chaos. Uh, shaky cam was famously used in the Jason Bourne movies to create a sense of intense action. So that would be an example of breaking the rules. You want stabilization. Well, no, we're going to break that rule with purpose, right? It creates a certain effect. In this case, 
it creates really intense action sequences because we're running around with these tracking shots uh, and shoulder cams that are bouncing up and down and everything is uh, very busy and very intense and very action packed. Angles. Let's talk about some different angles that cinematographers use. They can position the camera differently to capture images from uh, these different angles and create different effects. Um, so for example, a close up is something that's extremely close to the subject, usually a, a person's face. You get in nice and tight. Okay, so it's really, really close. Uh, maybe not that close, that's an extreme close up, but maybe something like this. And when you're really, really tight on the subject's face, this can create a sense of familiarity um, or discomfort. It can be kind of awkward to be this close. So uh, a close up is often used for really intimate or intense uh, conversations or emotional reactions uh, to really um, get the audience into the character's world. A wide out is exact opposite when you pull extremely far out. Uh, so this is not a zoom out, this is uh, just a shot that's set up extremely far away from your subject. And that can create effects like loneliness or distance or really place them in the context of their surrounding setting. A low angle is when the camera is down low and it's looking up okay, at its subject. Uh, this can create a sense of intimidation because your subject is looming over the camera. Uh, it creates a sense of largeness of the subject and largeness is importance in filmmaking. Uh, a high angle is the exact opposite. When we're up high, the camera is up high looking down okay, on its subject. So that means the subject is looking up at the camera. And the subject looks small um, and inferior. Um, so if you want to make your subject look and feel tiny, a high angle shot is great. An aerial shot is overhead, just like we see in this boat picture, uh, looking straight down. Um, it's, uh, we might call this a bird's eye view. Uh, again, this can create a sense of smallness of the subject, um, of isolation, of just how lonely they feel. Um, if we want to show that a person on this boat is really stranded out at sea, we might do a wide out aerial, right? That's very far up and just shows that they're completely surrounded by water. And that might create a sense of hopelessness. Um, a Dutch angle is canted or tilted to one side. This is not used very much, but it's a very powerful effect because normally cameras are square and level. And as soon as you tilt them, it creates a sense of awkwardness, discomfort, nausea, uncertainty. So you're, you see this a lot in, uh, say, horror films that want to make you feel a little unsettled. Point of view, a POV shot is from the subject's perspective, okay? So you need eye lines, you need to imagine where the subject is, and you need to place your camera there. So you're seeing things kind of through their eyes. Some films like uh, Russian Ark, uh, made in 2002, Hardcore Henry, 2015, Being John Malkovich in 1999, and Rear Window, that's a Hitchcock film from 1954, are shot mostly or entirely uh, from a point of view uh, camera perspective. Uh, and yes, Russian Arc is a one -er, and it's also shot entirely from first person perspective. Pretty crazy. An over the shoulder shot is from just behind an actor, exactly as it suggests, looking over their shoulder. So it's very close to, very similar to a point of view, uh, except that the actor is slightly in frame. Framing. Um, in pre-production, people start to think about framing. They turn the script into a storyboard, which is a comic strip style sequence of drawings. So you have all these little boxes and in the boxes, you start to draw how you want your shots to look. And artistically, you're creating um, a little comic strip version of the final product, the movie. And it's really important to storyboard in pre-production because it saves you all kinds of time and money down the road. Because when it gets time to shoot the actual sequence, you know exactly where to put the cameras and what to do. Um, but the storyboard is really where people start to think about framing. Framing is the art of arranging all of the elements in a camera shot or frame. It considers what is included and what is cut out. It means conscious placement of characters, key set pieces, horizon lines, and other lines. Um, so this is kind of like um, 
making a, a painting or or it's very important in photography as well right a picture you're thinking uh, artistically about how you'd like to set up this rectangle um, what we want to put in it and where and what effect that creates what do we want to emphasize what do we want to cut out all of these different things so there's some good standard rules for interesting framing um, symmetry symmetry means that two halves of the frame whether that's the left right halves or the top bottom halves mirror each other that makes for interesting shots so if you look at uh, the picture of the person meditating uh, by the ocean, that's very symmetrical, right? Even though their their standing position is not, uh, the person's in the middle of the frame, things are the same to the left and right of them. Uh, there's good left-right symmetry there. Uh, the rule of thirds states that significant objects should be placed into various thirds of the frame for an interesting um, framing. So that means you're splitting things up into left, center, right thirds or top, middle, bottom thirds. You're being very conscious of what you place there and rather than centering things in the center third it's very interesting often to place things off to the side for example um, in the picture of the person kayaking they're in the left third that means we have a nice two thirds in front of them which gives them space to look into and we really feel that they're looking ahead into the future or into their destination it's very awkward if you do it the other way if there's two thirds behind them that doesn't feel right and this is a good rule of thumb for shooting dialogue um, that you need to have uh, a person facing into an empty two thirds in front of them as they're talking to other people. Don't put a bunch of empty space behind them. It's also very important for shot consistency if you have two people talking to each other um, that one person is facing left in one shot and one person is facing right in one shot so that when you cut back and forth, it feels like they're looking at each other and talking to each other. Consistency is really important when framing. Um, say you have a car that's moving from left to right. It's moving uh, right in the frame. When you cut to an interior shot of the driver, make sure that they're facing right the direction that the car is headed as well. If you flip it and they're facing left, it's going to feel weird to our brains, like they're headed in the wrong direction or we're not in the right car or something like that. Uh, but rule of thirds, you can also see it in the tunnel shot, right? Uh, the people uh, on the right third are walking through this tunnel and that's instantly what we focus on as the subject try not to crop your subjects or important objects that means cut part or all of them out of frame that means you're having headroom uh, space above them and leading room space in front of them use the rule of thirds to create these spaces so in that kayak picture there's a bit of headroom above the kayaker that's important if we would crop and cut it off um, at forehead level that would look very wrong and amateur and awkward um, and we've got this nice leading room in front of her like I was mentioning so it looks like she's um, looking into the distance depth creates interest good rule of thumb that means think about placing objects in the foreground which is really front uh, close to the camera the background which is in the back away from the camera and even think about the middle ground which is in between while you're doing this, think about the size equals power rule, which states that larger objects in frame contain more significance. So, for example, we have some really good depth in the tunnel shot. Uh, the tunnel is, is going away from us into the distance. And we instantly focus on the people, the two people on the right hand side of the frame. Uh, that's because they're larger. They're closer to the camera. And so we assume that they're the most important ones. They're the subjects that we should be paying attention to, right? Uh, things in the background, there's people farther away, uh, we assume that they're less important. So the larger something is, the more importance it has in the shot, general rule of thumb. Leading lines means using visible lines in your shot, such as a fence, to draw viewers' attention to certain points. So you see a really good example of that in the tunnel shot, uh, where the, we have these nice leading lines that kind of come to a focal point in the center of our frame and our eyes nicely drawn in the direction that our subjects are walking into the distance.